Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The gate to heaven is narrow because it has a clearly stated exact requirement for entrance, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is found only in one person, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the only way to heaven according to himself and God, the creators of the universe. The wide gate is for all. It allows for human effort. People can work their way to, um, for those who, who have that kind of religion. It allows for all other world religions and even no religion. Jesus says that the narrow gate leads to a life of hardship and difficult decisions, and following Jesus requires crucifying our flesh. It is not an option. It is a requirement. We are also required to live by faith, endure trials with Christ-like character, that is something that is asked of us, and live a lifestyle separate from the world, that is another requirement. Most want to and end up choosing the easier road. Most gravitate towards comfort and pleasure, and when faced with the reality of denying themselves to follow Jesus, most people turn away. They even did that when they followed Jesus in reality. They turned away when it got hard. Jesus never sugarcoated the truth, and the truth is that not many people are really willing to pay the price to follow Jesus. And that is why many who think they are going to heaven actually won't end up there. They gamble with this lie that a loving God would not send them to hell. That's the lie that nearly everyone is gambling with. But those exact people hate following him. They despise his grace and mercy when he reaches out to them with an offer of forgiveness and love. God has never sent a repentant sinner to hell, and he never will. Only those who reject him will be sent there. We demand in life when there's these heinous crimes, especially crimes against children, that a judge sentence this person to a significant sentence in prison, yet the very same people question why the judge, who is the creator of all, would punish those who refuse to repent and demand on living life on their own terms. They don't want that. They can't understand that. If any sinner turns to God, repents and leaves their sin, God forgives them. The real question should be, why does God save the most terrible sinners who repent? That's the real question. God is good, he's rich in grace and mercy, and he doesn't desire that anyone would perish. It gives him absolutely no joy to honor the choice of those who have rejected him for salvation. God desires for all people to be saved, but many people simply love their sin too much and they refuse to walk away from it. That's the reason why they are not saved. Salvation does not give you another option. In John 5, 39 through 40, Jesus said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Refusing to come to Jesus, who's merciful, gracious, forgiving, that's why most people who end up in hell, shockingly, when they thought they were secure for heaven, they will die in their sin because they refuse to leave it. They refuse to come to Jesus because they love it more than him. John three nineteen through 21 says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. 1 Timothy 4 says, In verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. 
Matthew 24, 10 through 13 says, At that time many will turn away from the faith, will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. There have been false doctrines in the church all along, every generation, but there are some current ones that are very concerning and the reason they're so concerning is that the people who identify as Christian are very eager to accept them. They, they are so quick to bite onto them. No questions asked, no issues raised. And how is it that millions can eagerly follow significant lies that will cost them heaven? The only possible answer is that many of these who think they are Christian today do not read the Bible. Few Christians who identify as Christians seem to have developed the habit of finding time each day to actually read the Bible. We often would rather hear what someone has to say about the Bible than have to pick up a Bible and actually read it. The Bible points to this group as a group that will be deceived and fall away from the faith. And when God's people are biblically informed, meaning they know what the Bible says for themselves, these heresies have no chance of rooting in them because they know the truth and they can filter it immediately. Here are some of the current common heresies. One, that Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a wise teacher, a loving spiritual leader, a prophet, a special substitute sent by God to save the world. Many agree with that. But when it comes to saying he was the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, they struggle on that. There are many denominations who struggle with that. The Bible is clear that Jesus was God in the flesh who came to earth to bring salvation to mankind. He was never created, but was eternally in existence as a part of the three-member Godhead, Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus referred to himself as God. He received worship as God, and his disciples were taught that he was God. Another heresy, don't take the Bible literally. I even hear this from people. This lie believes that the Bible is a great, helpful book, inspirational, could even be somewhat inspired by God, but it also has errors, corruptions over time, and fables. It's written in for a specific time, a specific culture, and for today, it's mostly irrelevant. However, the Bible teaches that the words written are the very words of God himself and are meant to be received as authority in our lives and are timeless. God says they're timeless. Whatever culture we're in, we can still trust that this word is from God and that its teachings are perfect, eternally relevant, and it remains active, living, and will do the work that it was spoken to do. Another, God will accept everyone to heaven in the end. This is actually called universalism, but it actually um, filters into other denominations that think once a person is dead, you can continue to do things and possibly pay money, different things to retrieve them out of if they didn't make it to heaven, you can buy them into heaven. It doesn't matter what religion you were. Um, they say God wouldn't actually punish anyone with hell if there is these specific options. Some falsely believe in an afterlife that you will have another chance to return and get it right. Others just believe there's no one right way and that all roads eventually will lead to heaven. Others believe that Jesus is the savior of the world and that his death applies to everyone, whether or not you trust him. He died for all, and they assume that means all. The Bible teaches clearly that there is only one way to heaven. Turn from your sin, put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you deny or ignore Jesus or choose another path, you will not go to heaven when you die, according to Jesus, but you will be separated from God forever. Another common lie believed currently is that good people go to heaven. And as long as you try your best to be a good person, you will go to heaven. But nobody can agree on just how good you have to be. It's widely varied. And as long as you're a good person and follow most rules, most agree that that is sufficient for heaven. Many in the church agree with that. The Bible teaches that every person is infected with sin and even the good things we do are stained by our sin. God calls them filthy rags. God's standard for heaven is holiness, 
purity, and perfection. No matter how hard we try, we're never going to be good enough for heaven. The Bible teaches we need to be forgiven of our sins, made holy by God through placing our faith in Jesus Christ. His death on the cross cleanses those who put their trust in him for salvation. That is the only way to heaven. Another is often referred to as the prosperity gospel or word of faith. Christians can and should be healthy and rich if you are really living for God the right way and have enough faith. This gospel creates a false expectation that good Christians will be spared a hard life while weaker Christians are going to have to do a, endure great hardship, poverty due to their lack of faith. This is nowhere in the Bible. In fact, the Bible often talks about being rich as in negative terms and the suffering are referred to in positive terms. God can bless people with health and riches, but he can also bless some with challenges and suffering to grow them and bring great glory to himself. There is no reason given by God for a Christian to expect worldly blessings for being faithful or worldly difficulty for being unfaithful. It is simply not in the Bible. Another is legal, legalism. Legalism is pride. A person's belief that they can earn their salvation or do enough good deeds in order to keep their salvation, rather than living each day as a sacrifice to the king. It is often used to feel or gain superiority over others. The Pharisees were legalists. They murdered Jesus. Legalism can cause us to try to manipulate God, thinking he should reward us for good deeds. So we um, do good things and then we think because of that, God will bless us in this certain way that we want. Legalism appeals to the self-righteous, but it is completely unable to change the inner corrupt man. Only the Holy Spirit can create the character desired by God. Paul warns of false teachings as the number one reason why people will stray from and lose their faith. God is the only one who can help us discern false teachings when we hear them. 1 Timothy 4, 7, Rather train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Godliness is a healthy, balanced, God-focused life. Unhealthy teaching produces a kind of lifestyle that is only a form of godliness, a kind of outward religion and religious belief, but one which lacks its very nature of God and power. It lacks both, according to 2 Timothy 3.5. Someone who fears the Lord does not live in terror of God, but has a healthy respect for God and seeks in both heart and action to love God and never offend him. Our level of respect for God is going to show up in how we live. That's worth noting. Our level of respect for God will show up in how we live and the choices we make and how we spend our time. Godly people live in a way to please God. Ungodly people often don't even think about what would please God. They think about what would please them and they live their life accordingly. Hypocrites lead double lives, one for others to see and a secret life that is only known to them and God, who knows our every thought, our every intention. Paul warns in Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Godliness has this attitude, as in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it. Ephesians 5, 8. Live as children of light. Find out what pleases the Lord. Godliness is not just avoiding sin to escape punishment. It is not doing things that we know will hurt God because we love him more than we love sin, more than we love our own desires. That is why we do not go out looking for sin. Mark 12, 29 to 30 says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And true godliness can only be the fruit 
of love for God, which results in the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. When we sin, we repent. We ask for forgiveness. We follow Jesus again. We are forgiven by God. And that is how it works to be a follower of Jesus. Not that we won't sin, but we sure won't stay in it. We will repent, which means turn from it, ask for forgiveness, follow Jesus. You are forgiven if you follow it that way. Understanding grace is essential to understanding the gospel message. And we are recipients of grace as a gift. One of the worst heresies right now is about grace. Grace is often defined in the dictionary as the free and unmerited favor of God. Mercy and grace are two vital Christian terms whose meanings are often misunderstood. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Grace is God giving us something we do not deserve. When we understand grace, we come to know it as a gift, and many places throughout the Bible refer to the gift of grace, which is a perfect understanding of how we came to grace. Ephesians 4, 7, nothing is owed in return. Romans 5, 15, a gift is free to the recipient. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, a gift is generous and voluntary. 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we become owners of the gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the gift has nothing to do with our merit or our qualities. The gift of grace that God freely gives us is done through love, and he does not require a payment in return. But grace is priceless. God paid dearly for grace. Jesus paid even more. He paid with his life for grace. And those who have received salvation through Jesus are owners of this gift. We do not have to worry about God revoking it from us after we receive it. The Bible says over and over again, we do not have to count our works to receive grace. We don't. He doesn't want us doing that, either to earn salvation or to keep it. It's never going to be about our works. Those who teach the theology known as cheap grace, hyper grace, free grace, have created a doctrine about God's grace that contradicts the whole counsel of God. This doctrine destroys the teachings of the Bible about the finished work of Jesus Christ. All the past, present, and future sins of the believer have already been forgiven, is one point. God does not convict believers of sin, second point. Three, believers do not need to repent when they knowingly sin. Four, addressing sin in the life of a believer makes them sin conscious. The idea of carnal Christianity, which is what this ends up, it sums up to, teaches that as long as one makes a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, they are saved. Even if there is no obedience to the commands of Jesus to live a life of holiness and purity, they still call them saved. It is the idea that we can have Jesus as Savior, but we don't have to have him as Lord until a later time if we get there. People who make this claim for carnal Christianity or free grace, they don't deny the necessity of good works or holy living, but they separate the call from salvation and the call to discipleship. They make them two different things, which is not true according to the Bible. They are together. The discipleship is an absolute mandate following genuine salvation. This group believes that God has erased believers from any accountability for sin on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Yet even Jesus confronted the sins of believers in his messages to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The doctrine of free grace wrongly places emphasis on the finished work of Christ as once and for all and refers to the merits of Jesus' sacrifice as having put away sin. This heresy needs to be understood in the context by the author of Hebrews who in no way communicated this. They're misquoting it. Instead, he repeatedly warned those to whom he was writing of the dangers of apostasy. 
those who teach that God does not see your sins after you're saved because all future sins are already forgiven and that you should never be concerned with sin are teaching error and are risking being known as a false teacher on judgment day. Paul attributes this false teaching to the devil himself. The false teacher, he says, following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Then he condemns the character of these false, char- of these false teachers by saying, such teachings have come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. The putting away of sins and the once and for all references in the book of Hebrews has to do with the superiority of the new covenant in contrast with the old. It has nothing to do with believers not needing to repent of their sin, not even about that. It has to do with the permanent state of the finished work of Christ in contrast to the less than perfect atonement that was under the law. It has nothing to do with future sins already being forgiven. Under the law, the blood of animals could not purify a man's conscience in the sight of God, and those offerings were not sufficient to provide a lasting atonement for all sin. So this had to be repeated annually for a nation and daily for individuals. These sacrifices were not able to cleanse the conscience from guilt. Jesus' sacrifice provided forever atonement And that is why Hebrews refers to it as once and for all. The sacrifice of Jesus is perfect and it will last forever. That's what he meant when he wrote that. Christ's sacrifice being once and for all does not mean that God cannot see our sins when we sin. It does not mean that we do not need to repent when we know we have sinned. It simply means that there is no longer any need for the offerings for sins which were offered under the law pre-Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice will cleanse us and keep on cleansing us when we sin if we continue to follow in faith towards Christ, repenting of our sin. The term cheap grace can be traced back to a book written by German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer called The Cost of Discipleship, which was published in 1937. In that book, Bonhoeffer defined cheap grace as the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. The emphasis on this grace is on the benefits of Christianity without the cost of being a Christian, according to the Bible. That's how it got the word cheap attached to it. The idea that when God looks at a Christian, he only sees Jesus has some truth to it. We're truly the righteousness of God in Christ. We have been given the gift of righteousness and God accepts us on that basis. But if you think that the creator of heaven and earth is not observing your sin, you're living a lie. The Bible tells us that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we will give account. Hebrews 4.13 This warning is given in a letter clearly written to believers. If God cannot see our sins, how can he discipline us? The Bible says that whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you really love your children, you discipline them. God is the same way. If there is no sin to be disciplined, then that is a complete, that's an empty concept to even bring up. Any person who has been in Christ for some time and has never felt the chastening hand of God really needs to examine if they are saved because that's a very real part of walking as a follower of Jesus. The Bible says, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Hebrews 12, 8. God sees us. He hears every word we speak. He knows every thought we think. He watches our actions. He finds some pleasing and others he does not like. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. If Paul made it his goal to please God, he must have known it would be possible to live in a way that didn't please God because he made it his aim to please him. These false teachers suggest that it is never necessary for a Christian to confess their sins or ask forgiveness of God because God forgave us once and for all when we were saved, never again will we need to ask for forgiveness. The matter is already settled in God's eyes. 
many people are caught in the crosshairs of this lie. If they do not hear the truth and come to repentance, eternity will be a very different outcome for them than what they expect. Whenever a church only preaches the love and blessings of God in Christ without ever mentioning the need to repent or the consequences of sin in the life of a believer, there's a good chance this church is in error, which is incredibly dangerous to be in a church that is in error, and it's eternally threatening for the preacher himself. They use verses that the one who believes in Jesus Christ has eternal life and will be saved. Nobody disputes that. However, they omit the teaching that the call to salvation includes a call to repentance and holy living that is not optional. They cannot continue forward from claiming salvation to continue sinning. That is not an option. And for those who are doing altar calls and leading people to Christ and the prayer that you lead them in, the altar that you call them to, had better involve the cross of Jesus Christ because there is nothing else. There is no other way to give them salvation. If they don't understand that salvation involves repenting of and abandoning living for themselves, that they will now follow Jesus, you have not only completely misled them, but when they are told they are saved, they go out back into their life living for themselves, thinking that they are saved and they never revisit that topic. They tell people, we hear it all the time, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. They have no doubt. And most, when asked why they say that, they were told that. They were told that by a preacher, a chaplain. They were told that by someone who said, you prayed this prayer, you are saved. That is absolutely not true. To the church of Ephesus, Jesus said, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Revelation 2.4 Jesus rebukes five of the seven churches and demanded that they repent. Far from believers being unaccountable for their sin, we must all answer to Jesus for every even our good works are going to be evaluated, but there are sins of omission. Those are very serious, just as serious as sins of commission. In Mark 13, 31, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. More confirmation of the Bible being true. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised that the Father would send the Holy Spirit who will according to John 14, 26, teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. It is true that Christians have been forgiven by God, but that doesn't mean we never have to confess our future sin. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. If we are to confess our sins to each other, why would we not need to confess them to God since this sin is ultimately against God? 1 John 1, 9 gives clear instruction to believers to confess sin. It starts with the word if. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We cannot have the second without the first, if we confess our sins. We do not continue to confess our sin in order to be saved from hell, but we confess and repent in order to continue this intimate relationship with our Father. Every disciple of Christ has felt the overwhelming conviction of the Holy Spirit when they have sinned. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth. Truth, by its very definition, cannot tolerate what's false. And when the Spirit of Truth lives in a heart that is a true believer, he brings conviction about anything that is not the truth, which is why you will be able to discern what is a heresy. Those who cannot discern that and fall for any of the above listed heresies, and there's more, don't have the spirit of truth operating in their mind, which is very concerning if they consider themselves a believer, they're not able to filter the truth, which is, um, which is a indication that they are not 
feeding on the word, which is a mandate if you are a believer. Jesus Christ is most certainly our Savior, but this cannot be separated from the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as Lord, he commands that we obey him. And to remain his, we have to obey him. That's the only way. Discipleship following salvation is not optional and it has a cost. It requires repentance, which means turning from all of your sin and self-living and requires obedience to Jesus. Cheap grace seeks to hide the cost of discipleship from people. It says, as long as we make a profession of faith, we are saved. God's grace covers all of our sins. The apostle Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6, 1 through 2. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone is so much more than simply mouthing words as in a sinner's prayer. And so many Christian churches have fallen prey to this sinner's prayer heresy. Saying Jesus is Lord does not make you a Christian. There is an outflow from that belief in your heart that looks entirely different than someone who's still in sin. We are not saved by a profession of faith. We are not saved by praying a sinner's prayer. We are not saved by walking down an aisle. We are saved by a living and active faith in Jesus Christ, a faith that manifests itself in repentance, obedience, love of God, love of our neighbor, Salvation is not a transaction, it is a transformation. Paul says it best when he says we are new creations in Christ. There is nothing cheap about grace. Jesus was full of both grace and truth. The two are in delicate balance because if you tip one way or the other, it'll come very close to a false gospel real fast. We must always compare any new teaching with the whole counsel of God and learn to disregard anything that moves even slightly from the truth. This is why it's important to be part of a body of Christ, to be in community, because if you're not, it's subject to your interpretation, everything. It's really critical that you are part of a Bible studying group to stay um, undeceived. Paul says, teach the word of God. He speaks to Timothy to not let the false teacher's doctrine stand unchallenged, but to teach the truth with a series of commands. The Bible says to challenge these false doctrines. For us to just sit there and say, don't judge God's elect, or what are the other things I hear? Don't touch God's anointed. Um, There's multiple different rules that keep people from challenging something that is clearly not biblical that's coming from a pulpit and the bible actually tells us to challenge false doctrine one command and teach these things two don't let people discount you because of your youth these are all things paul said to timothy three set an example for believers especially in moral purity four devote yourself to public scripture reading preaching and teaching Five, do not neglect your spiritual gift. Six, be diligent, give yourself wholly to these things. Seven, watch your lifestyle and doctrine carefully. First Timothy 4, 16 says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So when you hear false doctrine, all the hearers are subject to being um to falling into a false gospel, which could lead them to an eternity completely different from the one they're expecting. It is up to us who truly love Jesus, whose only priority is getting people he loves into heaven, that we stand in opposition to the gospel being misrepresented. Eight, persevere, persist in this path without wavering. All of these are found in 1 Timothy 4. Set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. If it is godliness that we leaders are trying to teach, we cannot do it with just words. People learn to do what they see.
And that's unfortunate. Kids are that way too. You can preach the Bible at them all day, but they're going to pick up what they see. Therefore, people must see practical, godly living demonstrated in lives. Parents, leaders, it has to be shown. Consider the words of the Apostle John. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 1, 7 to chapter 2, 1. It is abundantly clear that John is writing to believers and he's addressing the issue of sin, for he refers to them as my little children in contrast to the world. It's dangerous to teach believers to ignore the conviction from the Lord. Teaching Christians that any consciousness of sin is something to be ignored is teaching them to ignore the voice of their own conscience when they are in sin. Hebrews 3 says, Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declare an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. 1 John 3, 19 through 21. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if your hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. The best way to do this is to read the Bible for yourself. There's really no other way to be a believer. There's way too many voices, way too many gospels. There's way too many things being said now, and the Bible has only promised there's going to be more. And it also says that the, even the elect are going to be pulled away into the apostasy. They will be lost if they end up in the apostasy. You have to read the Bible for yourself. We cannot depend on what others teach us. There's so much confusion even in what people would think is godly ministers who are watching all these um, YouTube videos of, of larger churches. But when you look at the change in the lives of the people who quote and adhere to and love some of these ministers, there is no change. They still live for themselves completely. If this was really anointed Holy Spirit piercing preaching, they would be so convicted of their sin, they'd be on their face. Much good can come from hearing good sermons. I often will. I love Times Square Church app. <laughs> the preachers at Times Square Church are, are so, um, that, that's probably my favorite. So there is, I, I really enjoy good sermons. Um, David Wilkerson's sermons, Carter Conlon. They're just amazing sermons. Reading books is good. There's a lot of great books out there. There's great people to learn from. There's some good, great Bible teachers with a clear understanding of the Bible. But it is critical to your eternity to be armed with correct personal understanding of the Bible because the false teachings are here, more are coming, and some of them are so close to the truth, they just inch you away gradually. It can take one lie to completely spin you out. 
do not leave the body of Christ. You need to be close to them because that's when that would happen even faster. We have to be able to filter what we're hearing. And now it's, it's kind of shocking. I don't hear anything about, there was like a few weeks where everybody was panicking over current events thinking, oh, do you think the end is coming? I got to ask, I don't know how many times. And now nothing again, everybody's fine again. Everything's calmed down. The only thing is nothing's calmed down. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happens, but people rear up and then they get sick of being concerned about the end and, and then they just lose all interest in it again. But the thing is, is that's very much marching forward. If you, if you paid attention to those who are reporting the real news, there's some far more concerning things happening now than there was a month ago. It is far closer. So in case people thought, my, my mom sent me something yesterday and I told her, I don't think anyone cares. I really don't think most people care. They're not concerned about things right now. You can, you can shake the earth and in a week they're gonna be back to normal. I don't know what it is that people, people just aren't following where we're going with all this. They just aren't seeing that God is screaming through events that he's coming and people just go back to their life and this is why he says we're gonna be caught unaware because nobody's paying attention. We want revival. It's gonna take some people to do that, but people need to care first. Precious Lord, you are, you certainly deserve our worship. You certainly deserve every bit of our lives. You deserve every single priority that for every part of our life, you have, you are the God who made us. You are the God who gave us the gift of life. You have given us the privilege of living in this country where we are free to share Jesus still. Pretty soon we won't be able to we we have so many blessings we have so many things that most countries wouldn't even ever see in this life we are drowning in blessing and we give very little attention to you because of that there is just too much stimulation in our lives forgive us god forgive us I ask that you would continue to pour out your spirit on those who will rise up and be bold and declare the truth I know that you're pulling an army together help us to take this as seriously as we need to be so many around us are going lost because they feel they can live for themselves and go to heaven. And you say, no, that is not possible. Even in the church, so many believe that. Jesus, I ask you to overwhelm people with truth and help them to bow their knee to Jesus Christ in every way, that they would surrender all their passions and priorities to you and choose heaven for eternity. It's nothing to gamble with. Time is so short. We're so grateful for you here and the life you've given us and the women that you have put around me this is just an extraordinary experience so i thank you from the bottom of my heart for how you got me to this place and these women and this calling it is the best thing that i have ever had so i do surrender completely to you and i ask that you would help me to be the very best example and the brightest light that I can be for you before Jesus comes. I ask this all 
in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.